As we begin to take a look at labor economics and begin to consider answers to the question, why do different workers receive different wages, we should take a look at the current labor market. In this module, we'll take a look at labor force, we'll define that, consider its dynamics, look at labor force participation, we'll then consider how we measure unemployment and employment rates, we'll then begin to take a look at some trends, both graphically and interpretively, with respect to trends in labor force participation, We'll look at types of, uh, of unemployment. We'll look at unemployment trends. And then finally, we're going to take a look at the natural rate of unemployment and unemployment in the production possibility frontier, or PPF. So let's begin by taking a look at the labor force itself and some values there and consider what labor force participation might mean to us. If we look at some statistics as of the end of December 2014, we see that the U.S. population in total was 316 million workers or 316 million individuals, of which approximately 156 million were workers. Those workers generated $16.8 trillion in gross domestic, gross domestic product, GDP, or the sum of all of the income for the entire U.S. economy for 2014. If we consider how, many, how much GDP that is per worker, it works out to be $107,603, which is a fairly high level of GDP. It's one of the reasons we're considered the wealthiest nation on the planet. However, GDP per capita, which now is going to take in how much GDP we have for all of our citizens, not simply how much GDP we have for all of our workers, is barely half that at 53,147, which makes sense since we have uh, only about half of our, of our population actually working in the United States at any point in time. If we think about the personal income per worker, on the average, that would be the mean, so that would be just less than $70,000, it's 69821 but the personal income per worker, or the median, is 50502 The difference here is the median is the income of the worker right in the middle of the spectrum. Not the average, but if we put all the workers in line together, the one right in the middle would provide, have the median income, where the average of all the workers would be the mean or the average income. might be interesting to note here. A, a pretty interesting difference. Look at the personal income per worker at just less than 70000 but that the income created for the entire society per worker at almost 108000 That's a fairly significant spread, and we might have to consider what accounts for that spread. And by and large, that spread is accounted for con with profit. Now, you might think that that's a very, very high profit, of course. I mean, we're looking at something along the magnitude of $40,000 here. But remember, that profit has to be has to give some reasonable rate of return on the entirety of the capital stock of the nation, all the technology, all the plants, all the equipment, all the land, all of the resources that we use other than human capital to produce. And so that may not be as high a percentage rate of return as you would suppose, but in fact, it is about a $40,000 spread, and that $40,000 spread is a significant amount, and perhaps that accounts for some of the income inequality that we consider in our economy today. You might also think about this difference between this personal income per worker and personal income on the median, at, and there's about a $20,000 difference there, which difference might also tell us something about inequality, because the average worker, including all the, the upper income workers and lower income workers, is almost 70000 but the median worker, the one right in the middle, so, so John Q. Public, if you will, is only a little over $50,000. When we think about this a little bit further, we then see a personal income or mean income per capita of 28,281. That makes sense to us given the other relationships we're establishing. And then, fi and then finally, we look at some numerics that are percentage or relational, proportional. And this would give us a labor force participation rate of 62.7%, which actually isn't exactly what we see when we think about the workers versus the whole population. So we may have to think about what that means. An unemployment rate of 5.6%, which of course is well off of the highs from the Great Recession, and then an inflation rate for 2014 of just 0.76%, of which is less than 1%. We know that it, uh, in, inflation has been very low in recent years coming out of the recession. So let's look at a little bit more along these lines. 
first we should think about what the labor force is. The labor force is not all working age individuals. The labor force isn't just the part of the population over 16 years of age. The labor force is the number of employed plus the number of unemployed. Well, the employed in this case are those that are working in the formal labor market. The formal labor market being that part of the market that reports wages that that uh, is subject to FICA and Medicare, has some withholding tax, and where the workers are paid in a very obvious, in a very legitimate fashion from their from their firms. The unemployed simply aren't those potential workers, those adults that aren't employed, but they're those adults that aren't employed, but that are actively looking for work, willing to accept employment. In most states, we think about this as people on the unemployment rolls uh, who are part of the unemployment benefit system uh, with the, the Department of Workforce Services in many states, which means that they have to actively be seeking work. They have to report periodically and evidence that they're actively seeking work. In most cases, that's every week or two. And they have to be willing to accept an appropriate job for them. So there might be many people in the marketplace that are neither employed nor unemployed, but that might be old enough to be employed. The labor force are those that are employed and unemployed. Well, let's consider how we, how we measure this. First, we think of this as a labor force participation rate. So what part of the economy or of our nation of would-be or possible workers are actually employed or unemployed or part of the labor force. Well, we have to then define what that that, pos that section of the economy is that we think of as the potential. And we think of that largely as a population, male and female, uh, regardless of where they are in school, uh, ages 16 to 65. Now, this is historically the value that's considered. However, we might have to stop and think, is that a reasonable uh, denominator to have in this labor force participation relationship? It is the denominator that's used. And so this is what we'll use in this course. This is what's commonly used in any of the reporting mechanisms that you'll observe. But is that one that's reasonable for this point in time? Do we see that people stop working universally at 65? And how does that compare to prior decades? Well, clearly, we don't see that. We see that some people retire early and are able to stop working before age 65. Uh, so they've taken themselves out of that, uh, that labor force, if you will. They're not employed. They're not unemployed. They don't intend to be employed. They have retired early. They have the resources to be able to do that. Or perhaps we see that people well beyond age 65 are very actively involved in the labor force, either as employees or as uh, those that would like to be employees still. Many people, uh, certainly as the baby boom has passed through or begun to pass through this part of the population uh, that are now they're entering their 60s and, and some of them have entered retirement, uh, we now see that many of those people have chosen to continue to work, maybe because they need to, maybe just because they derive some level of satisfaction or utility from doing so. And even someone at 67, 70, 75 years old may simply choose to still be an active and engaged part of the labor force.